Hello, every, everyone, and welcome. Um, <laughs> um, this is a day that uh, my dream, uh, I can say it came true, and I know for many of you. Uh, a wise man once said, I might not be an optimist, but I am a prisoner of hope. Who was that wise man? Dr. Cornel West. <laughs> uh, so don't let anybody tell you that dreams do not come true. I am so uh, proud of our college uh, for uh, this event. Many people helped, many people were behind this. Uh, so nothing will happen with one person only, it was a teamwork. And uh, I was just talking to uh, one of the students a couple of days ago about this event, and not just a couple of them, a lot of them, and the way that these students look up to Dr. West, we at the end uh, came to this conclusion that he's the prophet and we are the apostles. So having him here, it means a lot to all of us. He's absolutely my hero. I've learned so much from him. He brings so much hope to us when we live in a world that has so much despair. So I can talk about him for eternity, but I need to keep it short. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the equity, Student Equity Committee for their efforts and everybody else. Uh, and now I have the pleasure to introduce our president, who is sadly leaving us soon, but uh, he will be here till December. He just uh, became the chancellor, and uh, we are all so thankful uh, to have some a president in our college that would be supportive of such an event, and uh, it's a pleasure to invite him to stage. President Oakley. Please give Anahita a warm round of applause for all her efforts. All right, are you all ready? All right, well welcome everybody. It's great to see you all here. Great to see all the students here. All the students, please stand up. Let's give Dr. West a great Long Beach City College welcome. It's wonderful to see so many of you here from the Long Beach City College community gather today to talk about and to listen to and to discuss and to think and to commit yourself to such an important topic, um, equity, equity in our society. And I know Dr. West will speak more about that, but that's why we're gathered here. Um, but first, I want to recognize a few people who, again, make uh, opportunities like this possible. Um, first, uh, I want to thank all the, the faculty and staff that are here and continue to be supportive of our students and making sure that we keep um, the great diversity that we have on this campus at the heart of everything we do and talk about. I also want to recognize our members of the Board of Trustees who are here today, uh, Mr. Doug Otto and uh, Trustee Vivian Malaulu. Thank you for both for being here. I also want to thank everyone in the community that supports our students and all of our Long Beach College Promise partners from uh, Long Beach State University, Long Beach Unified, uh, the mayor of Long Beach. I know they are all with us here today and supportive of what we're doing here at Long Beach City College. I also want to make sure and thank personally uh, those who are behind the scenes for today's event. Of course, as has been mentioned, the Student Equity Committee, and in particular, Faculty Co-Chair Shauna Hageman and Administrative Co-Chair Karen Rothstein. Thank you. You know, this event is sponsored by the Student Equity Initiative, and this is a statewide initiative that uh, really for the first time in the California Community College's history, we are actually being intentional about what we all know needs to happen. 
we're being intentional about investing dollars into these kinds of conversations and more importantly, the action that needs to follow today's conversation. Because although we are all here to listen to a wonderful, eloquent uh, person who has carried this message throughout the nation, we know that nothing will change unless we take today's discussion and put it into action the minute we leave this theater. So that's what student equity is all about. And we are organizing ourselves as a college and as a California community college system around this notion that we need to be intentional about looking at data to see who is being left behind and why. We need to be intentional about how we reorganize our colleges to ensure that those individuals no longer get left behind. And we need to be intentional about making sure that we're providing opportunity to everyone. You know, I've heard it mentioned many, many times in my conversations across the nation that, you know, we really need to help students beat the odds. This is not about beating the odds. This is about changing the odds. Equity is all about changing the odds. So I hope that um, this conversation gives you the energy and the commitment you need to carry this message forward and to do the work we need to do both as students, as staff, as faculty, to alter the equation that has plagued us for too many years. So thank you all for being here. So um, without further ado, I want to welcome and recognize our guest today. Um, many of you know uh, Dr. Cornell West. He has been a champion of social justice for his entire career. Uh, we're thrilled to have him here today, and I think this is a particular great moment in time for Long Beach City College to have him here. Because as we talk about these issues, it's great to have such a dynamic and committed individual to this issue here with us today. So, uh, we're excited to have him today to speak about education and the struggle for social justice. I hope that you all make this part of your commitment. Um, you all know that Dr. West is prominent and a proactive democratic intellectual, a professor of philosophy at Christian practice at Union Theological Seminary. Uh, by the way, uh, our trustee Doug Otto is also a graduate of that wonderful institution um, and a professor emeritus at Princeton University. Please, let's all stand up and give Dr. Cornell West a great Long Beach City College welcome. What a blessing to be here in Long Beach City College. How blessed, how honored, how privileged I am. Thank you all so very, very, very much indeed. I want to thank the captain of the ship, my new friend, Eloy Ortiz Oakley, for his leadership and moving on to another ship. Let's give it up for the president on to become the chancellor. And I don't have words for my dear sister, and I heat uh, my Davi. She is a gem. She is a Jew. She's visionary. Yes, she is. She's my dear, dear sister. She's my comrade. She is my colleague. And when it comes to my dear brother Lee Douglas, 16 years. 16 years of high quality service to this grand institution, and he still got a smile on his face. <laughs> oh, yes. It's a very special sister here who I want to salute. Her name is Cheryl Williams. And Cheryl Williams. Where is Sister Cheryl? Where is Sister Cheryl? Where is she? There she is. There she is. Give it up for our dear sister. Absolutely, and this, I want to salute, to, oh, my sister Terry Long has done some wonderful things. I want to acknowledge Sister Terry Long, yes, yes, indeed, indeed, and Shauna Hagerman as well, Shauna Hagerman as well. Now, I was blessed to meet 
I was blessed to meet such magnificent students just an hour ago. Just walk into the room, I could feel a special kind of spirit here. And that makes a difference in an educational institution because you all know education is just not about skills, it's about shaping of soul. It's about trying to create a certain kind of human being who's courageous and visionary and willing to serve and sacrifice. And that's what this is all about. And I want to thank my dear sister here for working it out. And I got my brother who's coming, my indigenous brother. Yeah, there he is. He's going to come work with me, too. I can't do it by myself. But you can see I am in no rush at all. <laughs> Not at all. I move by the spirit. I am who I am because somebody loved me. Somebody cared for me. Somebody attended to me me. And the highest honor I will ever receive has nothing to do with Harvard or Yale or University of Paris, but it has to do with being the second son of the late Clifton and the present Irene B. West. There's an elementary school named after my mother right outside of Sacramento, California. Irene B. West. That I I am a product of the chocolate side of Sacramento, California. <laughs> Glenn Elder, little league coaches like Mr. Peters, a Shiloh Baptist Church in Oak Park, legendary pastor Willie P. Cook, and he was a pastor, he was not a CEO. We got a lot of CEOs now in mega churches, but you don't see a lot of mega love. A lot of mega building, but you don't see a lot of mega concern about mass incarceration. And some of them have mega cars. But where is the mega courage? That's the tradition that I'm just a small part of, and I choose to be a part of that tradition. You see. So by the time I got to Harvard and Yale and Princeton, I was already spiritually fortified to get the kinds of tools necessary so that I could try to bear witness and be a force in the world, a force for good. But it begins with the love. The Isley brothers call a caravan of love. A love of truth. And the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak. Anytime anybody tells you about a truth about yourself or you tell yourself a half truth about your past, if you don't allow your suffering to speak, you can rest be assured it's a lie. America's the same way. If America wants to know the truth about itself, begin with the suffering, begin with the children, begin with the prisoners, begin with the working people, begin with the women, begin with the gay brothers and lesbian sisters. Allow all of those voices to come to the top because I come from a people whose anthem is lift every voice and a voice is not an echo. If you're just lifting your echo, you can rest be assured you're not telling the truth. And we live in a moment where people are afraid of the truth. They'd rather evade it. They'd rather avoid it. They'd rather hide and conceal it. It's just about getting over, being obsessed with the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. No, I come from a people who've been terrorized and traumatized and stigmatized for 400 years. And in the face of that kind of institutionalized hatred, what did black people do? Talk the world so much about love. Like John Coltrane's Love Supreme. So much about love. Toni Morrison's Be Loved. So much about love. Never been a character on the stage 
in the history of America. And I thank my dear brother Tony for allowing me to be in his office with that magnificent spirit, given his professorship of the theater. Never been a character on the American stage with more love than Mama, written by Lorraine Hansberry, that genius from the south side of Chicago in her 20s. She'd be dead at 34. Another genius dead at 33 named Donny Hathaway who's taught us so much about love. Stevie Wonder's love in the need of love. Love soaked essays of James Baldwin where James Baldwin says what? Love forces us to take off the mask we know we cannot live within but fear we cannot live without. Courage. One of the challenges these days for the magnificent students here at Long Beach City College. Is it will you have the courage to be in connection with the tradition? That's a caravan of love. And we black people, we have no monopoly on it. I could talk about my Persian brothers and sisters. I could talk about my Italian brothers and sisters. I could talk about the Irish. I could talk about the Scots. All cultures have prophetic strands of people who have been willing to tell the truth, bear witness, cut radically against the grain, and pay a cost. Not just get over by any means. And so I want to begin with an epigraph from the greatest of all public intellectuals in the history of the American empire. His name is W.E.B. Du Bois. And I'm sure you all read the great W.B. Du Bois in this grand institution. Born in 1868 in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, and he died in Ghana the same night that a young Negro preacher told America about a dream that he had named Martin Luther King Jr. in a chocolate city named Washington, D.C. Du Bois, Harvard train, studied with Max Weber in Berlin came back to the United States, Atlanta University, Wilberforce University, on to founder along with others of the NAACP, editor of the crisis, long distance freedom fighter. And I want to begin with the four questions that he raised, and these are the four questions for each and every student here at this college. And it has everything to do with education. And I want to make a fundamental distinction between education and schooling. They're not the same thing. Education is what the Greeks call paideia, P-A-I-D-E-I-A. -E and paideia has to do with that deep formation of attention that gets you to shift from the superficial things to the things that really matter. How do you undergo a process in which you are able to somehow evade our culture? This culture is a culture of weapons of mass distraction. <laughs> to get you distracted from the things that really matter. The superficial things of status and image and spectacle as opposed to what kind of human being you gonna be from your mama's womb to tomb. You're not here that long. W.E. Du Bois says, I've got four questions, and you can call it a love letter to the younger generation. That's really what it was. In 1951, Du Bois puts pen in the paper, living at 31 Court Street in Brooklyn Heights, the greatest borough in the world, Brooklyn. Oh, yes. Actually, he'd been, he was living in the house that was transferred to him by a great literary artist named Arthur Miller, one of my dear brothers. You all know him from Death of a Salesman and all of my sons and a whole host of other powerful plays. But Du Bois is in handcuffs. Context, very important. He's in handcuffs. U.S. government put him in handcuffs. 81 years old. He's working with the World Peace Center. He's trying to eliminate nuclear weapons. And they say that somehow he is an enemy of the state. He had one visitor, 
that come to his house who was living under house arrest at 4951 Walnut Street in Philadelphia. His name was Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson was the most famous Negro in the whole world in 1939, but in 1951, his passport had been taken away, like his best friend Du Bois, and he is living under house arrest because he is in fundamental solidarity with poor people here and around the world, and he told the truth and was willing to pay a cost. Could you imagine being a fly on the wall listening to that dialogue? wonderful book called The Professor and the Pupil with Du Bois and Paul Robeson. I know you got it in the library here. Check it out. Check it out. Du Bois says, I'm going to write three novels. The first novel is called The Ordeal of Manzart. The Ordeal of Manzart. You turn to page 275 in that novel. And Du Bois says, Here's the first question. How shall integrity face oppression? How shall integrity face oppression? What is integrity? A willingness to be true to yourself, morally consistent. Jane Austen, one of the great all-time all greats of the English novel, called it constancy. A willingness to pierce through superficiality and mediocrity. And because all of us are different, no one like us in the world. Or as Sly Stone put it, everybody is a star. That's my tradition. Sly used to play organ in my church every fifth Sunday in Sacramento. We knew him as Sylvester, but he's known to the world for the genius that he is, Sly Stone. Everybody's a star. There's no one like you, just like your fingerprint. It is unique, distinctive, irreducible, irreproducible. But at the same time, no one has a voice like you, even though you can be an echo and sound like everybody else. So the, the boy says, how shall integrity face oppression? Each and every student, you have to decide. What is your calling in life, not just the career that you are pursuing? What is your vocation, not just the profession you want to be a part of? What is your life task, not just the job you need in order to get some cash flow to take care of your loved ones? And only you can answer that question. Only you can wrestle in the dark precincts of your own soul and say, this is what my passion is. Like John Coltrane says, yes, this is my passion. I'm going to blow this European horn in such a way that no European has ever blown it to nobody else. And I'm going to blow 18 hours a day and go to bed with the horn in my mouth and wake up blowing. Here's giant steps. Here's impressions. Here's expressions. Here's love supreme. This one's for Naima. Coltrane, true to himself, dead at 40 years old, but lived three lifetimes. Integrity. My favorite thing, the best seller. He could have done that over and over again to make big, big, big money. What does he do? He grabs Arthur Shep. He grabs Farrell Sanders, young folk, teenagers, and say, we're going to do some free jazz. No, that's not going to make money. I'm not in this for the money. You don't understand who I am. My name is John Coltrane. I got a vocation, I got a calling. It's not just about the Benjamins. It's not just about the trophy wives. It's not just about the mansions. It's not just about living large in some vanilla suburb. It's about what kind of human being I'm going to be in the short time that I'm here so I can leave witness and empower somebody and help somebody before I die. And he's not isolated. He comes from a long tradition, connected to integrity. It's a fascinating story about John Coltrane when he moved from North Carolina to Philadelphia. He lived in the projects. And he kept blowing his horn because he's the only, only child. He had lost his grandfather, his grandmother, and his father all in nine months. That's catastrophe. That's trauma. We all have to deal with catastrophe and trauma in various ways. When he got to Philadelphia, he kept blowing and and the, and the folk in the, in the project said, this, Negro, this little Negro is making too much noise. 
Alice is his mama's name. Y'all gonna have to move. And the two days before the, they were getting ready to move, there was a knock on the door. Little John opened the door. And there was a black preacher. Didn't know his name. He handed Coltrane the keys and said, you come in my church and you blow anytime you want, day or night. There is no John Coltrane without that black preacher. There's no love supreme without that black preacher that allowed that young Negro genius access to a space where he could continue to be true to himself. Oh, that's what we want Long Beach City College to be. We want it to be a place where people can explore integrity, explore their calling, and have the kind of teachers and administrators and, that will love you so and care for you so and be concerned for you in such a way that you can soar like an eagle. And all of us need that in our lives. We all need it in our treks and in our journeys on the way to the world integrity but it has to begin with the truth telling reminds me of socrates line 38 of plato's apology uh, the unexamined life is not a life for the human you know our english word human derives from the latin humando and humando in latin means what burial we are the kinds of creatures and organisms who are on the way to burial and we're conscious of it that's where the word humility comes from and humanity comes from tied to the earth, tied to the dust. And therefore the question becomes, how do you muster courage? How do you muster vision? How do you muster compassion? Well, I've told students in 40 years that I've been teaching, every time they come to my class, I say, now this is education, this is not schooling. And in this class, you're going to learn how to die. And they said, dang, Professor West, I've just come to get a grade. And <laughs> what kind of philosophy class is this, learning how to die? <laughs> Plato says, philosophy itself, philosophy, a love of wisdom is a meditation on in preparation for death. To philosophize is to learn how to die, says Montaigne, who created the very genre of the essay itself. The Seneca says, he or she who learns how to die unlearns slavery. How do you shatter bondage and slatters, shatter slavery? you got to learn how to die. What do you mean by learn how to die? By courageously examining your life, your assumptions, your presuppositions. And when you give up certain prejudices and presuppositions, that's a form of death. And it's an endless process of cre creatively and critically examining yourself, that egoistic self, that narrow self, that cruel self, that mean self. And through learning how to die emerges a new self. That's what education is all about. Endless process. It's like falling in love. You meet somebody and all of a sudden you got a smile on your face, tingle in your soul because that old, isolated, lonely, cruel self, you're trying to push it out because now you're a new self entangled with another self. That's what it is to grow and mature. There is no maturity, there is no growth, there is no rebirth of yourself without learning how to die in order to learn how to live well. That's what integrity is about. And the sad thing about it, in the history of America, America has always been in denial of forms of death. That's what makes America so immature culturally. It's obsessed with material things and possessions and commodities, but when it comes to learning how to die, it wants to stay on the surface. Look at the U.S. Constitution. Do you see any reference whatsoever to social death? That's what U.S. slavery was. Black people, we were socially dead even though we were physically alive. 
The women could be raped and violated at whim. Children could be sold in any part of the South. The men were viewed simply like the women and children as commodities and cattle to be so socially dead, but spiritually very much rich, as we shall see with the spirituals. But look at the U.S. Constitution. It's a denial of social death, which means from the very beginning, there's a false innocence, and you're going to move from a false innocence to corruption without a mediating stage of maturity. You're going to end up fighting a civil war over an institution not even invoked in your constitution. 720,000 precious human beings killed because you fighting over something you denied. 22% of the inhabitants of the 13 colonies generating the very wealth which is a precondition of the democracy and you claiming you were founder of the democracy. And we ain't even said a word about our precious and priceless indigenous brothers and sisters. Not even a mumbling word yet. Denial again. I hear these politicians all the time from the White House to the State House talking about slavery was America's original sin. That's a lie. America's original sin was the treatment of indigenous brothers and sisters. Slavery was number two. Slavery was number two. Don't try to deny somebody else's suffering just because you preoccupied with yourself. The truth is broad enough to be a challenge to each and every one of us. And the truth for our white brothers and sisters who couldn't vote. They had white skin privilege, but they couldn't vote because most of them didn't have any property. And none of the women voted no matter what color they were. It's just the truth. Brother West, how come you so hard on America? You must be anti-America. No, I'm anti-injustice. I'm anti-lies in America. That's what I am. That's the tradition I come out of. You see? The, the boys taught us integrity, and we all fall short. Integrity is not purity. Integrity is not being pristine. We all fall short. Samuel Beckett is right. You try again, fail again, fail better. That's what they're going to say at your funeral. <laughs> she tried. She, she was magnificent and loving and smiling and courageous, but we know there were moments of failure in her life. That's what it is to be human. That's humando. That's humility. But the question is, what was the quality of your bounce back? was the quality of your bounce back? Did it have integrity? But we live in a moment of what? Venality. What is venality? Everything for sale, everybody's for sale. All you got to do is offer enough money. I know Wu-Tang Clan called it cream a little number of years ago, didn't it? <laughs> Cash rules what? Everything. Around me doesn't have to rule me. It's Wu-Tang Clan got it going on now. <laughs> oh, they, they part of the same tradition I'm part of. They wise. They keeping track of the truth, of the suffering, of the injustice, the monstrosity of the injustice. That's why I can't stand it when they talk about it's a problem. No such thing as a black problem. It's a catastrophe visited on black people. No such thing as a woman's problem, a Jewish problem, a Palestinian problem, a worker's problem. It's catastrophes visited on precious human beings who then have to respond and work it out in some way. Don't trivialize it. Don't confuse the problematic with the catastrophic. Because it trivializes the suffering and trivializes the impediments and the obstacles. Or put it another way, it deodorizes the discord. And I like to stay with the funk. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's why I spend so much time with geniuses like Bootsy Collins and George Clinton. Because they funk masters. And they understand the truth is, all of us emerge in the funk of our mama's womb. Now, you may say you got here some other way, but go on and testify and make a fool of yourself. <laughs> 